the Global Democracy and Justice Lecture Series with Oded Gilad and Dina Freeman. Episode 25, Pathways to World Federation. In these videos, we have shown you why we need global democracy and why we think that adding a layer of democratic federal government at the global level is the form that it should take. But how do we actually make this a reality? In this video, I will have a look at some of the different possible pathways towards reaching such a democratic world federation. In the heydays of the world federalist movement, soon after World War II, many believed that we could just jump from the present world order to a democratic world federation in one jump. And thus, the two main pathways pursued at the time were to either radically reform the United Nations Charter to transform the organization into a world federal government, or alternatively, to organize some kind of a world constitutional assembly in which representatives of the world's population, either states or parliamentarians or otherwise elected people, would draft a federal world constitution, which would then get ratified by states and create a world federation. While both of these pathways still have those who hope and work for their realization, most mainstream scholars and activists now agree that the transition towards a world federation seems now much more likely to be staged and incremental, moving forward in small steps which hopefully get us closer and closer to the goal. So one of the current ideas is to gently and gradually reform and democratize the United Nations. There are many campaigns that work in this direction, sometimes with notable success. For example, in 2014, the World Federalist Movement, together with AVAZ, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung New York, and the United Nations Association of the UK, formed the One for Seven Billion campaign. The campaign's aim was to make the election of the United Nations Secretary General more democratic. It quickly gained a lot of momentum and was supported by over 750 NGOs from all around the world. Prior to that campaign, the five permanent members of the Security Council used to discuss potential candidates in secret and choose the next Secretary General themselves, bringing their agreed nominee as a single candidate to be elected by the General Assembly. But this was just a technicality, and the General Assembly always accepted the candidate dictated by the Security Council. This process was highly problematic, as it meant that only the governments of these five countries – the USA, Russia, China, the UK, and France – could choose who they like, while the governments of other countries – not to mention anyone else – did not have any real say. The outcome was that the Secretary Generals that got elected over the years were usually rather weak and grey those that would not take a stand and not challenge the status quo. Since the UN Secretary General is a position of considerable influence within the organization, it is important to have someone who is well qualified and committed to the interests of humanity. The non-democratic selection procedure that existed until then did not guarantee either. So the One for Seven Billion campaign proposed 10 very specific reforms to the election process, which would make it much more open and inclusive. They proposed that the UN would issue an open call for nominations to member states, parliaments, and civil society, with a clear list of selection criteria and a clear timetable. They suggested what should have been obvious, that the list of candidates with their CVs should then be published for all to see, and that candidates should publicly present their leadership vision and goals if they were to get the position, and participate in question and answer sessions with member state governments, the public, and the media. They further argued that the whole process should be transparent and that there should be no secret backroom deals in the Security Council. And finally, they proposed that the Security Council would not make the final choice, but that they would present at least two candidates to the members of the General Assembly and that they would make the final choice. After considerable pressure from the campaign, as well as from several supporting governments, the United Nations adopted a resolution in 2015 which accepted some of these changes. They initiated a totally new process, which included a call for candidate nominations, a list of basic criteria, the circulation of candidates' names and CVs, and the holding of informal dialogues with candidates. 
This was a big win for the One for Seven Billion campaign and has led to the election of the existing UN Secretary General that was held in 2017 becoming much more open and inclusive than it has ever been. The process is, of course, still far from perfect and the campaign continues to work to improve it further. But it shows that it is possible to make some incremental improvements to the UN system. And if enough small changes are made, one could hope that they would eventually add up to a significant transformation. Recently, the World Federalist Movement has been central in another such reformist campaign, the Coalition for the UN We Need. It also brought together a large coalition of many NGOs working together to make the UN stronger, more inclusive and more democratic. And indeed, there are many other campaigns and initiatives that are working to slowly, bit by bit, push the United Nations in the direction of becoming the democratic political institution that will be at the center of the future World Federation. Another pathway is to start building new institutions which could serve as the institutional building blocks of a future world state. This could include new global courts, like an environment court or a human rights court, or other needed institutions such as a global tax body or a reformed and much more effective global health organization. Whilst these organizations would first be created within the current intergovernmental system and thus would be far from perfect at the outset, they could hopefully become seeds for the global institutions that we need. National states often evolve like this, only coming into being after some of the basic structures were already in place. So there is good reason to suggest that this is a necessary step in preparing for a future World Federation. This approach was successfully pursued by the World Federalist Movement in the second half of the 1990s, when it led the NGO coalition for the creation of the International Criminal Court. The members of the coalition put pressure on governments to create the new court that would hold individuals, even if they are state officials, accountable in case they cause the worst kinds of human rights abuses, such as genocide. Even though several major states were against the initiative, the effective pressure put by the coalition, consisting of thousands of NGOs, eventually tipped the balance and led to the International Criminal Court being established in 2002. And at present, the campaign for a UNPA, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, is pushing hard for the creation of a new assembly within the United Nations. Unlike the General Assembly, that is made only of representatives of governments, this new one will be made of parliamentarians, as the first step towards hopefully creating a real world parliament. The special importance of the UNPA would be that it would allow parliamentarians from all political parties, including opposition parties, to get involved in the UN and increase the connection between the UN and the people of the world. So if the time is right and the pressure is big enough, it is possible to get new institutions created. Which means that this is another important pathway to pursue to form more NGO coalitions to push for the creation of more global institutions. Another pathway is to democratize the existing international institutions. This could increase the democratic accountability of the decision-making and could push them in the direction of becoming truly democratic global institutions. So, for example, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, is extremely undemocratic because the voting rights of the member governments are dependent on how much money they put in. So instead of one state, one vote, it's more like one dollar, one vote. This is obviously very problematic as it means that basically the rich and powerful countries dominate the decision-making process while poorer countries have hardly any say at all. The USA in particular, with just above 15% of the votes, effectively has a veto on the most important decisions which require an 85% majority. So campaigning to change this voting system would be a very important way to make this key intergovernmental institution more democratic. Another major feature of contemporary intergovernmental organizations that makes them undemocratic is that they do not reach down to the world's people. There is no way for individual citizens to have the say or influence discussions in these bodies or even to know much about what is being discussed there. So another way to democratize these bodies would be to form parliamentary assemblies or citizen assemblies within them. In this way, delegates who are chosen by citizens and are accountable to them would be involved in these organizations. So just as the campaign for UNPA is pushing for a parliamentary assembly at the United Nations, 
There could be also campaigns calling for the creation of parliamentary assemblies at the IMF, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization and so on. Democratizing these powerful intergovernmental organizations, both in terms of balancing the voting powers of different governments and of including citizens' voices, would begin to change the way that these organizations function and the types of decisions that they make. Over time, it could lead to important shifts in the world system and push us closer to global democracy. Another major pathway is to start by building up regional federations that merge within them several existing nation-states. The idea here is that either one successful federation will continue to expand and accept more countries until the whole world will be united, or that few regional federations will form and later unite into one. So in this pathway, activists push to increase and deepen regional integration and the democracy of such unions. The European Union is the obvious example here, as countries in Europe slowly and gradually integrate closer and closer together. There are several organizations, including the Union of European Federalists, the Young European Federalists and DiEM25, Democracy in Europe Movement 2025, who are campaigning and advocating for a democratic European federation. And over time, the EU has transformed from a simple confederation into a kind of a hybrid structure that is part confederation and part federation, and that is becoming increasingly democratic. Over time, it can hopefully continue transforming until it becomes a truly democratic federation. Other projects of regional integration are much further behind, but slowly moving in a similar direction. The African Union may one day transform into a Pan-African Federation, as Nkrumah and others had wanted from the beginning. And there is Mercosur, the South American Common Market, and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. One way to work towards World Federation is to work to strengthen these nascent regional unions and push them in the direction of democratic federation by encouraging them to form new policies and new institutions. For example, Democracia Global, a WFM member organization in Argentina, is leading a campaign to establish a Latin American and Caribbean criminal court that will be dedicated to combat the problem of transnational organized crime. Known as COPLA, the acronym for its name in Spanish, this campaign seeks to establish a new regional court which will be able to deal with the crimes of drug trafficking, human trafficking, money laundering, and so on, that take a huge toll on communities across the whole region and that have escaped the control of national institutions. As well as solving a pressing issue in the region, the proposed new court could be also an important institutional stepping stone towards building a future Latin American federation. It is very likely that the way towards a democratic world federation includes all these different pathways. So it's not about choosing one over the other, but about pushing from many directions at the same time. And the absolutely crucial thing is to build mass support. We need a mass movement of people all around the world demanding global democracy and world federation. The issues of global democracy and global justice need to become matters that are publicly discussed in newspapers, on TV and on social media. There need to be discussions and debates, education and awareness raising. At present, as long as people don't have a democratic say beyond their national borders, most of them, if they think about politics at all, are focused only on their local national politics and incorrectly believe that local problems can be solved by local politicians. But those days are over. In our highly globalized world, most problems can only be partially resolved at the local level, if at all. Most local problems require also global solutions. So the more that people write about this and talk about this, then slowly or quickly, this awareness will grow. And as awareness grows, then action will soon follow. The results of public opinion surveys, the spectacle of mass demonstrations and protests and hashtags, will send an important message to our national politicians that the people want global democracy. This will encourage them to put global democracy on their platforms so that they will win votes and support. And the rise of world federalism on the political agenda of some countries will greatly help the issue rise also in other countries, and then they could together promote initiatives to democratize the global level. It will be amazing if existing parties will put global democracy on their agenda 
But it is also possible that we might see the rise of new political parties, which will promise specifically that if elected, they will lead the move to democratize the international system from within, in their role as ambassadors and state representatives to the United Nations and the World Bank and so on. Just imagine if the state officials of a few powerful countries started to push for democratizing steps in these organizations, then there is a good chance that they would happen especially if there was also a large civil society coalition pushing in the same direction. In the context of political parties, one approach would be to set up transnational political parties pushing for global democracy. Imagine, say, that we had a global democracy party standing in national elections in the UK, France, Germany, India, Japan, Ecuador, and so on, with a shared platform of specific ways that they would further global democracy if elected. If the national branches of the party won the elections and came to power in their respective countries, their ministers and officials could then work together at the UN and other intergovernmental organizations to bring about change. This is a very exciting possibility, and something very similar has already started within the EU, where a transnational political party, the European Spring, stood in the 2019 elections in several European countries with a shared platform of turning the EU into a democratic federation. While sadly they were not so successful in those elections, the path-breaking initiative has started to pave the way for transnational politics. As well as getting the issue of global democracy into mainstream politics, it is also hugely important to build up support among NGOs and social movements. At present, most NGOs and social movements focus their energies on trying to improve one particular thing – human rights, inequality, refugees, climate change, and so on. But what this means is that all this positive energy is being dispersed in lots of different directions, trying to make a small change here and a small change there, instead of a structural change. But underlying all of these other problems is the basic problem of the lack of global democracy. If we, the people, had a say in global decisions, then we could decide to institute a global system that would truly protect human rights, make and implement policies that would reduce inequality, make life around the world so good that people will not be forced to dream of leaving their countries as migrants or fleeing as refugees, to finally take serious steps on addressing climate change and so on. So instead of standing on the sidelines and begging government representatives to consider our view, we should change the system so that we become the decision makers. Then we will be able to solve all these problems much more effectively. So what we need is a kind of a great convergence of all the social justice NGOs and movements to come together behind the call for global democracy. If that would happen, we would truly be a force to reckon with. So the pathways to global democracy and world federation are many and complex. And it might seem that it is too difficult or that it will take too long or that it is simply impossible. But it is important to remember that some things that seem to be impossible do happen. At the beginning of the 19th century, the idea of democracy at the national level seemed to be an impossible, utopian dream. But around 100 years later, after years of struggle and demonstrations and protests, it finally became not just a reality in many countries, but one that is taken so much for granted that it is hard for people to believe that it was ever different. Similarly, in the 1980s, people were so used to the Cold War that they couldn't imagine that it would ever end. But then, suddenly, it happened. And there are many other examples. Change does happen, sometimes slowly and sometimes in an unexpected bang. But it is actually far more unusual that things just stay the same. Our current system, with nation states and a very weak international confederation, may seem normal and natural, the only way that things can ever be. But that is simply not true. 150 years ago, the world was organized in a completely different way. There were huge empires, most states, if they existed at all, had very different borders to the ones that they have today, and very few people had the right to vote. But in a relatively short time, empires have disappeared, nation states have become dominant, democracy has become widespread, and a whole range of international organizations have been established. That's a lot of change. So the next 100 or 50 years, or the next 20 years in our fast-changing world, will more than likely see a lot of change too. The key issue is not if there will be change, but what that change will look like. And probably the most important question within that is whether we will move towards deepening global oligarchy, 
or towards global democracy? Do we want a future with rising poverty and inequality, climate change and environmental degradation, constant surveillance through artificial intelligence and big data? Or do we want a future that is just, democratic and sustainable? We are sadly well on the way to deepening the system of global oligarchy, where a relatively small minority of the world's population make all the decisions and do so in their own interests with little concern for the rest of humanity and for the planet. If we sit quietly now or put our efforts into initiatives that are simply distractions and that do not bring about real change, like the SDGs or giving some charity here and there, or just zoning out and entertaining ourselves on Netflix, Facebook and so on, then that's where we will end up. We will sleepwalk into a more intense global oligarchy. But if we want global democracy, then we need to start acting now. The exact path forward may not be super clear, it never is, but if we all come together and push in the same direction, then that's the best chance we have to get there. So if you want to help create a global democracy, there are many concrete things that you can do right now. See if there is a World Federalist Organization near you. If there is, then join and get involved. If there isn't one, then set one up. If you contact the World Federalist Movement or any of the other member organizations, they'll help you and give you some ideas and starting points. Or you can get involved with the Young World Federalists. Their activities happen online, so you can take part wherever you are. Importantly, you can endorse the UNPA campaign. Check out their website, sign the petition, offer to volunteer with them, write to your member of parliament about the need for a UN parliamentary assembly, and take part in the global week of action for a world parliament. If you're a good writer, write articles or posts about global democracy for your local or national newspaper, or in online journals, or in your blog. If you're good at creating social media memes, Create some about global democracy and spread them around Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. And if you're not so great at creating new content, then just like and share good stuff that other people are making to boost their visibility. But in any way you can, get a conversation going about global democracy and let your friends and family and colleagues know that you are a supporter. Of course, you can share these video lectures on social media so that more and more people would see them. You could also organize a group of people and watch one of the video lectures together and then have a group discussion about it. You could even organize a regular study group, like a book club or course or a workshop that will meet regularly for a period of time and go through all the lectures or just the best ones. As well as important, it can be fun and stimulating to discuss these ideas with a group of other people and afterwards, some of them might be inspired to join you to set up a World Federalist chapter or organization or to organize other campaigns or activities. And if you're involved with an NGO or a social movement, then raise the issue of global democracy in their next board meeting or at a policy meeting. Show people how the lack of global democracy underlies the issue that your NGO or movement is working on and how bringing about global democracy would enable your particular issue to get actually resolved. See if you can get your NGO or movement to support World Federalist campaigns and to join the great convergence around this cause. If you are involved in a political party, raise the issue there and try to get it included in their manifesto. See if you can get the issue raised in parliamentary discussions, and see if you can make links with similar parties in other countries with a view to establishing a transnational network of members of those political parties in support of global democracy. If you're an academic, then check out the website of the World Government Research Network and join them. Write books and articles analyzing how the existing problems that humanity faces need nothing short of global democracy to be really solved. Organize conferences and seminars on the topic Build up a vibrant research community which will take forward the thinking of how to democratize global politics. And if you're a student, raise the issue of global democracy in class discussions. Read what the academics are writing about it. And you can choose to write your own thesis on a topic related to global democracy and then send it to the World Government Research Network so that it can be shared with others. If you are a policy specialist or work with a think tank, then get the issue of global democracy on the agenda and write research and policy briefs with proposals of how to move forward. And if you're a funder or a philanthropist, or even just a reasonably wealthy person with some money to spare for a good cause, then make a donation to a World Federalist Organization. 
Get in touch with the World Federalist Movement or with us at One World or with any of the other WFM member organizations and discuss how you can help. What new initiatives could be carried out to bring us closer to global democracy if only they had your financial support? You might be surprised at what an impact a relatively small amount of money can have. Whoever you are and whatever you do, get involved. The struggle for global democracy should be and may well be the major struggle of the 21st century. It is only with global democracy that we will be able to implement real human rights, reduce economic inequality and deal with the climate change. We have very little chances of solving these problems in an international system of oligarchy. Our voices need to be heard and our vote needs to count. And that will only be possible if we have real global democracy, a government of humanity, by humanity and for humanity. So get involved and take action now. Thank you. The Global Democracy and Justice Lecture Series is also available as videos on YouTube and other platforms. If you found the ideas in this episode interesting, please share it.